Hello, Uvalde Methodist Church. Thank you for your interest in the Global Methodist Church, the denomination that we are about to join. That takes effect May the 7th with the Lord being our helper. I'd like this presentation to begin with a short little film clip provided by the Global Methodist Church. And yeah, so please watch it and then they'll, you'll come back to me and I'd like to go through some slides of the most frequently asked questions that people have asked of me. So of course you can approach me at a later time if you have specific questions, this isn't meant to answer every single question that you may ever have, but at least to start our journey together. Enjoy this little clip. Imagine a brand new church, a church based on the cherished and time-tested principles of salvation in Christ and Christ alone, a vibrant 21st century Wesleyan expression of faith that is committed to what John Wesley called scriptural Christianity. Imagine a new church that brings the salvation of Christ to the world and brings the world to Jesus Christ. It's a covenant founded first and foremost upon the Bible and the biblical doctrines of our church, from the Nicene and Apostles' Creed, to the sermons of John Wesley, to our articles of religion, to the theological insights of Christian thinkers through the ages, faithful servants of the word, a church that embraces each of those expressions not merely as historical documents, but as the living guidelines and guardrails as to what it means to be a Wesleyan Christian, worshiping God in spirit and truth. It's a covenant based on mutual respect, not on a trust clause. When it comes to who owns a congregation's property, it trusts the local church to manage its own affairs. In the global Methodist church, every congregation controls its own property. It's a covenant led by pastors who willingly submit to a shared gospel that calls all to live holy and dedicated lives that are bound together, not by a guaranteed appointment, but by a deep commitment to love and to serve others in the church, using all the spiritual gifts and abilities that God has given them, all the while doing all the good they can in every place they can and as long as they can, because while there's no guaranteed appointment, there's also no mandatory retirement. What's more, true to its name, in the Global Methodist Church, there are opportunities to serve for women and men, young and old, those of every ethnicity and ability from nations all around the world, as well as those who are currently ordained and those who are presently licensed local pastors for whom the pathway of ordination will be streamlined. For all that matters is the passion and the effectiveness which a pastor brings to his or her calling. Likewise, the Global Methodist Church is one that continues to endorse the ancient exercise of the Episcopal office following the practice of much of African Methodism. However, bishops will not be elected for life, but for one or two terms, after which they may return to the greater calling of being pastors of God's people in local settings. For it's a church in which bishops are also held accountable in ways that are not possible now. It's a covenant with a book of doctrines and discipline that's only about 100 pages long. It's designed to operate with fewer boards and agencies and a greatly reduced overhead, with shared giving requests capped at no more than one and a half percent for general church expenses. And most of that's for missions and church planting. And there's a cap of no more than 5% for annual conference cost. That's about half of what most of our congregations are paying right now. It's a church with a robust social witness, one that proclaims a clear word as to the sanctity of human life and the protection of the unborn, the unwanted, the differently abled, and those in the twilight of life. It calls for the careful stewardship of the world and its resources. And it speaks a positive word when it comes to human sexuality, understanding it like a beautiful river that God has created, but one which can be destructive indeed if it overflows outside of its intended banks. In that respect, while not denying that love may be found in many places, the Global Methodist Church affirms the witness of Scripture and the century's old understanding of the church in defining Christian marriage as a holy and loving bond between one man and one woman. It also laments every expression of sexuality which dehumanizes, objectifies, abuses, or denigrates any woman, man, girl, or boy in ways that do not reflect God's ultimate will for all of his children. And it pledges to help in Jesus' name any who are looking to be healed from all sexual brokenness. 
Finally, the Global Methodist Church is a covenant that will look and feel very familiar to most Methodists today. There will be conferences, both regional and global. And within the local church, you will find a structure that includes a finance committee, a board of trustees, a staff parish relations committee, and a leadership board or council. And initially at least, pastors and congregations which choose to come together into the new church will remain together as well. This is the Global Methodist Church, an ancient future movement of people whom God is raising up to be a powerful witness to Jesus in this world. To quote John Wesley, the world is my parish. So everyone who is ready for a fresh wind of God's spirit blowing across this land is welcome. Now what follows next is a you're going to get a mix of slides or presentations that the Global Methodist Church made, and then I have inserted my own slides in there that will expand with more detail the, the granularity that people have asked me for. So you see there that we are the Global Methodist Church, and who wouldn't want to be part of a warm-hearted, Holy Spirit-inspired church? The point that is the Global Methodist Church, the hierarchy would like us to present to the world is that we're not a denomination started out of hate or on any negative issue. We really are a denomination of, a worldwide denomination of people of diverse backgrounds. The thing that we have in common is a love of Jesus Christ. So you'll see that our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, who love extravagantly and witness boldly. We also have the need to, you know, present ourselves to the world, to the community. And that's, you see that on, if you need to tell your friends, how long has the Global Methodist Church been around? You can see that we began on May the 1st of 2022 with a, it was launched by this transitional leadership council. For me, when I saw that, I said, well, who is the transitional leadership council? You'll see there were 17 members. I didn't list all 17 on this slide, but I listed what I thought was important for us to see. You'll see that the Reverend Philippe Ajoba, district superintendent of, the, of an African country, Cote d'Ivory, or pardon my French, but the Ivory Coast, as we would say in English, You'll also see that there's the Reverend Dr. Kimba Evarista from the Democratic Republic of Congo. You'll see that we have bishops from Texas, right? You know, so Texas is like a whole country in of itself. You'll see that we have a Korean pastor serving in Russia. And then you'll see that we have a lawmaker from the United States that's also a retired lawmaker. So this transitional leadership council represented our worldwide global church. Okay, now what kind of things are we going to say? What are our core confessions? The Global Methodist Church, you can read, professes the Christian faith. And this is how we will work with other denominations. As a Christian denomination, with the traditional, orthodox, with a small o, Christian faith. We are not innovating in any way, shape, or form. And as you'll see, we are also distinctly Methodist. We're carrying on the tradition, particularly in this local church. Since our founding in the 1850s, there is nothing radical, new, innovative. It is the traditional Wesleyan Methodist practice of our faith. So it's important to say, well, when we say that, what, what is our traditional things? Of course, it's the Bible. And it's the Apostles' Creed. Now, these are things I should point out right now. Currently, our Articles of Religion of the three denominations that joined together in 1968 and became the United Methodist Church, all of those are in our new Book of Discipline from the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline. You hopefully can see how much thinner this is than this. 
it's a much simplified, much more simplified structure of the church. But the important part is in this, you'll, in a couple of slides, I'll bring up the restrictive rule. The restrictive rule means we can never take the three confessions of faith of our founding documents or the three founding denominations of the United Methodist Church, they can never be removed from this book. The same thing, the restrictive rules apply to this book, but we have, we have gone and added some more traditional statements of faith to solidify what it means to be a member of the global Methodist Church and what it means to be a member of this local church. So you say, we have the Bible, we have the Apostles' Creed has been added to our, our book of faith, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedon Formula, if you're interested in what that is, that's why I put at the bottom of the slide there, you'll see the, uh, the Global Methodist Org, What We Believe, if you want to go back and read that. It's a little bit longer than a paragraph. It takes the Nicene Creed, which as you know, so the Apostles' Creed is the most basic. The Nicene Creed expands particularly on the person of the Son and then on the person of the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. The, the Chalcedon, or Chal, some people say Chal, uh, Chalcedon formula, that even gets a little bit more granular in the persons of each member of the Trinity. Then I told you already we have the articles of religion of the three denominations that came together to form the United Methodist Church. We're still taking that heritage into the global Methodist Church. They are in there. We have gone back to adding Wesley's 44 standard sermons. That has been part of the understanding of what it means to be a Methodist since the 1700s. And then you'll see the general rules of the United Societies. Let's go ahead and look at what those general rules are. You'll see that the general rules, when, when John Wesley was a boy, and that was a long time ago, as he was at Oxford, they started this group that wasn't called the Methodist originally. Methodist was a, was a derogatory term used for these overly religious college guys. Instead of going out drinking and doing the things that college boys have done since there have been colleges, these guys were seeking the Lord. They were seeking it, seeking the Lord, seeking uh, God very intentionally, and they came up with some general rules. And to be a member of their society, you placed yourself accountable to those general rules. The three simple rubrics are do no harm, do good to all, stay connected to the sacramental and devotional life of the church. They are still part of our heritage and part of our transitional book of discipline in the global Methodist church. They're, I won't pretend that they're not challenging rules. They're, they're much more detailed, very specific things that the small group should seek to live by. And yeah, as I said, we, we, as, as we embrace this, the Global Methodist Church would love to hear that we are going back to the class meeting system, which is what the general rules covered. Um, but we'll see. It's hard. It, this is, it's part of our book, but it really does take some commitment to live by the rules of the general society. I mentioned earlier the restrictive rules, and that basically means that those documents that I just delineated on my previous slide can never be taken out of our book of discipline for the global Methodist church. The same restrictive rules, but for a much smaller list, was part of the United Methodist Church. The difference is that it is clear by the behavior of some of the leaders of the United Methodist Church and by some of their statements that they no longer actually believe those rules. They, they love having them in the discipline, but they do not believe and practice the articles of religion anymore. So on the day that the restrictive rule, should it ever become a day when the global Methodist church, where this restrictive rule is just to keep tradition in the church and we're no longer practicing and living 
by the, the Articles of Religion and these, by the Nicene Creed, by the Apostles' Creed, by the Chalcedon uh, expression, then we'll, it, it will be time to look for another home. And may that day never come. Organizational distinctive, the Global Methodist Church, as it says in the slide you're looking at, the willing, not the constrained. And the constraint has always been the trust clause. And the trust clause, as it says there, and that's what this whole vote is about on May the 6th, is to come out, you know, there's been the first time that Methodist churches have been able to leave a Methodist denomination and keep their property and their bank accounts and everything, every, everything that belongs to the church. This is the first and only time it's ever been possible. So we're taking it. We're going. And, and on May the 6th, hopefully that will be approved and, and we will be leaving. The global Methodist church that we're being received into does not intend to make us sign a trust clause Every piece of property we own today will continue to be locally owned and held by Uvalde Methodist Church. And so there it is. You see a further delineation on the trust clause. And, and this trust clause isn't just for local churches. It's for every level of organization in the global Methodist Church. The, their property belongs to whatever group that is. What I like about the Global Methodist Church, or one of the many things I like, is the focus on the local church. That, they recognize that is the reason we exist. We need that hierarchy, and I'll talk about some of that hierarchy a few slides from now. But the essence of what God would have us do as we advance the gospel of Jesus Christ is the local church. That is where the work gets done. That is the bride of Christ. And so you'll see that this denomination plates that as the missional center. In other words, this is where ch lives get changed. This is where the sick get visited. This is where the prisoners get set free. Those sorts of things. Those other parts are, I think, Anybody who recognizes that a fellow believer is a brother and sister in Christ, it should be global. It should be long-term relationships. It shouldn't be whims and, and, and falling out of relationship with one another. So, connectional funding. Of course, this question comes up all the time. How much will it cost to be part of the Global Methodist Church? That sounds tremendously materialistic. But the truth is we are, we are given resources and we're to be good stewards. So let's talk about apportionments. You'll see the global connectional funding is set at 1%. That means the, the payment for the hierarchy of you know, those at the highest level of the global Methodist church is just 1% of our income. Then you'll see that the local church, our local church, will give 3% to the Mid-Texas Conference. We are part of the Mid-Texas Conference. We're District 16 of the Mid-Texas Conference, but they can never charge us more than a total between what the hierarchy at the highest level and our local conference can never total more than 5%. And... I like that it says the Mid-Texas Conference, if they ever get more than six months operating expenses in the bank account, they have to start rebating money back to us. Imagine that, a limit on how much they can accrue so that we never get reliant on bank accounts, that we have to trust on a living, giving local church contributing to the upkeep of hierarchy that we need and and the features of a denomination it's encouraging and then if we ever become that mega church even if this church becomes million dollars in the collection plate every sunday there is a cap of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars is the most that a local church will ever have to give uh to the to the to the denomination 
The local church is where ministry happens, but as you see in this slide, the charge conference is that connection between the local church and the denomination. And it happens at least once a year. It can also happen whenever the presiding elder calls it. We don't have, and I have this on a later slide, we no longer have district superintendents. We have presiding elders. And that the charge conference is, is a transaction between our local church and our presiding elder. And things can get decided at the charge conference with a simple majority vote of those present. And that makes it very easy uh, to take care of business. For us here, the church council is the leadership and decision-making body of the church. That is already part of the new incorporation documents that, we, that we, we applied to start our new corporation as the Uvalde Methodist Church. We specifically listed the church council as the legal entity that will control the decisions of our church. And so you'll see there, uh, now this has yet to be put into uh, we're going to rewrite our constitution. We, we consulted with a lawyer so that we did a, a interim constitution so that we could meet the deadlines that the United Methodist Church had placed on us, which, which we have met. Uh, I, put, I have already carried those documents well ahead of the April 21st deadline so that on May the 6th, we should, as I said, have met every goal and be... Uh, released from the United Methodist denomination. But those interim documents were merely that, just enough so that the state of Texas, the Secretary of State's office, would grant us a certificate of a new nonprofit organization. But we still have some work to do, and we will do that through the church council beginning May 8th. At that church council, we will begin writing our new constitution so that it specifies the committees that you see here on this list. Enough said about that, except to say there is work to be done. Let's go to the bishops now. You'll see the statement of the denomination there that this, a bishop is an apostolic office. It is also a biblical office, and so we will be under a bishop. We have, we're still very much a denomination that is forming, so uh, the bishop we have today may not be the bishop by June when the greater number of churches that are disaffiliating join the Global Methodist Church. They're going to have to kind of shuffle bishops around. So I, I did not post our current bishops because everybody is in transition. But we will have a bishop over our church in our area. You'll see that... John Wesley believed that bishops and elders are part of the same New Testament order. In other words, the New Testament does not create a hierarchy. Elders are mentioned in the New Testament. Bishops clearly have oversight of elders, but they're not some different... They're not like archbishops and all of the things in other denominations. There's not a hierarchy to it other than for the sake, not for the sake of ordination, but for the sake of order. So you'll see, and, and this is the problem that we had in the, Uval, uh, in the United Methodist Church, was the lack of accountability to bishops who served for life. They could not be stripped of their office, or at least in recent history, even violations of our book of discipline did not lead to stripping uh, bishops of their ordination. So we're going to have in the global Methodist church, they're going to be consecrated to bishop, meaning not ordained to bishop. They will be elders consecrated for a set period of time. The time can be renewed according to the requirements of the office and by the general cabinet there. But there will be a day when they go back to being pastors of local churches or they retire and, and take normal retirement. But they won't be bishops for life. They will put down the bishop's crook. Presiding elders. I told you we have a new word for district superintendents. 
They are, of course, they have to be elders in full connection, meaning that they have been serving the Global Methodist Church. They have all of the rights and privileges. They are under a bishop. The, the bishop's cabinet will make the assignments for where presiding elders, what churches, what, what geographic regions they have. They serve at the bishop's pleasure, and they too have a term limit, just like the bishops. And should they complete their office, they too will return to being a pastor of a local church, should they so choose. Now let's talk about how we get pastors, because that is a, a crucial feature of, or one of the advantages to belonging to a denomination, and a crucial feature is not having to do as our brothers and sisters across the street have to do, which is getting a committee together and to go out and do a call. Our, our pastors, as you see there, um, the bishop and the cabinet work towards getting us a pastor. The difference or the change now for us is unlike under the United Methodist Church where every year the pastor and the SPRC consulted together to say, hey, are we going to change? So it was on a 52-week a cycle. The, the Global Methodist Church wants invitations to be longer than that because you get the stability that people desire. That I know certainly the congregations desire uh, if they have a, a pastor they really like, that the pastor doesn't, you're not always worried each year, are you going to leave, you're going to leave, you're going to leave. This, hopefully this system will will tend to stop the turnover rate of, of pastors. We've always had, even under United Methodists, we had deacons, and deacons then turned into elders. That's going to be a similar process in the Global Methodist Church. I think you're going to find that there may be people that, that pastor local churches that stay permanent deacons. What does this mean? Under United Methodism, deacons served as chaplains and they served in a lot of other capacities, but they didn't really pastor local churches because that is an office usually reserved for elders. I'm an elder. And the downside to becoming an elder from a deacon is that you then are subject to being moved by the bishop. This will stabilize, as you see at the bottom of the slides, people are going to be able to stay deacons and stay with a local church um, for as long as they care to do that. Then for those on the traditional track of going from deacon to elder so that they have all of the privileges of the sacraments and, as they said, their word, sacrament, and order, that will also have requirements and be part of the process. And so there still will be full elders serving elders that are subject to uh, being assigned by a bishop and, and must be ability or they must have the willingness to move if, if told to do so. So the appointment of pastors, how will this work now under the Global Methodist Church? It is meant to be entirely or much more consultative than under the United Methodist Church, where pretty much once the SPRC and the pastor put sent their papers up to the conference office, they just waited kind of to see, like the Academy Awards, and the envelope, please, and you find out whether you stay or whether you go, and if you go, where you go. The congregation didn't have much involvement in that process as you see on this slide, this is meant to be much more consultative. In other words, the SPRC and the bishop's cabinet are going to be talking to each other. They're going to get a chance to know of a name and talk about it before it ever gets announced. And hopefully the, the cabinet will consider the... Uh, the thoughts and 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 I don't want to make it sound negative, but you know if the if the SPRC has some misgivings about a name, if if that is the case, then the bishop, uh, what does it say there? They must the SPRC must be given the opportunity to put input and to raise any concerns they may have.
When a committee raises, you see there, substantial and missional concerns, uh, the bishop and the cabinet must consider it, and they must also provide a rationale. They can't just say, we're the bishop, we're the cabinet, this is who you're going to get. There's, they must be very um, clear, transparent, and as you see there, the process of consultation is mandatory in every annual conference, and the other bishops will hold bishops so to, to this, which means that if a congregation feels as if their bishop didn't consult them, that congregation can go to the Council of Bishops and say, we weren't consulted. So there's a little bit of an appeal process that there never was under United Methodism. We are a new denomination, or we're joining a new denomination, the Global Methodist Church. Experience of talking to other churches right now, there has not been, I was afraid, I was concerned when we started this process, not so much for Uvalde Methodist Church, because I knew that I would be, you know, that you all had invited me to stay. But I am old, you may have noticed the gray hair. At some point, I knew I would have to move on, and I wondered, in that day, would there be enough pastors to come to Uvalde? And, you know, the other churches, the, the smaller churches, I was grateful when I saw that in the discipline, there's enough of a process to almost guarantee that, it, that you won't have to ever, well, this church probably never has to worry about it, but let's talk about the uh, Catulas of the world and, and the further on down the, you know, either I-35 or further out I-90, that um, I was happy to see that there's provisions for supply pastors and then that we have the... Um, the lay appointments. So if there's a promising lay person in the congregation that the congregation says, can we have, you know, we, we haven't been able to get an acceptable candidate. Can we have, I'm going to, since Mark Underwood is the, is the whipping boy these days, let's say that this congregation, there was an overwhelming clamor to say, let Mark be our pastor. You can see that that is possible. Now, of course, that means then, as you read in the slide, that if Mark is going to be your pastor for more than a year, Mark will have to begin the training and the process to become ordained. Um, so, uh, again, Mark, no offense, buddy, but I knew that you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't panic. Nothing makes you panic. But I was happy to see that there is all kinds of provision for pastors in the Global Methodist Church. And that you don't have to accept an untrained pastor. There is a distinctly or a distinct training process set out by the bishop and its cabinet so that even though somebody may not start their journey as a pastor trained, they will have to continue to go on until they are a fully trained pastor in the Global Methodist Church. Let's now talk about members because this question has come up. The top paragraph is from, is part of the original slide. Many people will become a member in the Global Methodist Church when their local congregation becomes a member congregation. The second paragraph is, I added that text. So we are asking the members of FUMC Uvalde to indicate whether they wish to have their membership transferred to our, air quotes, new church, because it's not a new church, but organizationally it is. And an affirmative answer from an existing member of FUMC is all that is required. In other words, we're not going to be having membership Sundays where 50 people need to come be, that we're always members here. But this will allow us to, to we're going to send, uh, If okay, let me back up. You'll see in the newsletter, the main newsletter, that you can just call the office or send an email to say, okay. I want to be part of Uvalde Methodist Church. Put my membership there and we'll put a little tick next to your name on the membership roll. For those that don't respond in any way, we will be sending a letter with a self-addressed stamped envelope to, to say, please indicate what you would like us to do. Would you like to be a member of the, this Uvalde Methodist Church, a part of the GMC, or would you like us to remem remove your name or would you like us to transfer your membership to some other church? That will all be possible. We're going to do that through mail so that when this process is over, we have 
a going back to that earlier slide, we have a church of the willing and a church of that has indicated, yes, I want to be a member of this church. But it's not going to involve a process of like we do now when we have somebody join. Now, if you're not already an existing member of FUMC, then yes, if, if you join this church after May the 7th, we will still have membership questions that come out of the transitional book of discipline. And our last slide, kind of a, a strange thing to end on, but it was something that I was unexpected when I was reading the discipline. And so you'll see that the Global Methodist Church in, encourages the use of non-alcoholic wine or juice for Holy Communion. And that is... We're going to go by that. I don't want you to think we're going to, on May the 7th, serve wine at communion. But it does mean that if you go to a global Methodist church, you may find that you get served actual wine. But the discipline says even churches that serve wine must have a grape juice alternative. And so that uh, was just interesting to me to say, oh, we are now going to be part of a denomination where it's possible to go to a communion service and what's in the cup is actually alcoholic wine. But the discipline says we must have a grape juice alternative. And uh, just one of those things that when you're reading through a book, you say, oh, well, that's probably something that people will miss. This concludes this little introductory class. I hope I've answered some of your questions. I'm available to answer whatever ones that, that you ask. And if I don't know the answer, and I probably don't, because I won't claim to know the new transitional discipline, but I certainly can look it up for you. I think we're going to be much happier and stronger for being a global Methodist church than we would if we had remained in the United Methodist Church or if we had gone off on our own. So please journey with us in the Global Methodist Church. Thank you.